right, so the talk. So I'm going to talk about TypeScript. And this, like the subheader there, like from script to type to diving deep, that was actually my attempt to kind of have the agenda inside the meetup, like the talk, like the presentation title as well. So it should hopefully be a story where we're going to go from like the world of JavaScript that everyone's familiar with. Um, we're then going to write a bit of types just so we can see like kind of what TypeScript is about. And then we're going to dive deep into some of my favorite TypeScript features and how it can kind of help you with some more familiar scenarios like Redux, for example. So we're, we're going to see all of that. Um, but just before, just so I have an idea of how much time I need to spend on each of those sections, um, who's used typed languages before, like Java, C Sharp, Flow? Awesome. OK. Uh, who's, used, who's used TypeScript specifically in like a bigger project? OK, cool. OK, perfect. Right, so a bit about me. So I'm Radish. If you're not sure how to pronounce that, um, ima imagine like a radish with like an R in the middle. Uh, just feel free to use that. Um, I've been working with TypeScript for the past four years since I graduated, so it's kind of been like my language of choice, like for like for my whole career basically. Um, and I've worked for like big banks, like a small startup, um, and I've used TypeScript on kind of big projects most of the time. Um, I am an instructor on Egghead.io, so it has it's a really good website. It has like really um, like like the format is really really short videos that are very on to the point. So for example, like most courses on their website take at most half an hour, uh, like half an hour, 45 minutes. So like really short videos. And I've published on this website um, a talk, like well, a course where I talk about the more practical advanced features of TypeScript. And I'm going to show you some of those today as well. And yeah, I'm also an organizer of Glasgow.js. So our next meetup is happening on the 14th of August, and we're actually going to have a talk on React, hopefully. So just come over. It would be nice to have like more React experts in the audience. Um, and yeah, those are my details, my blog, and my Twitter. OK, so how would you? So let's start from like the main question. Like if you're, if you're in a JavaScript project, and you kind of want to use TypeScript, how would you go ahead and just add TypeScript? Uh, in there, right? Because you, you have like your whole team. A lot, some of them might not have used TypeScript before. Um, like, you, you need to you need to introduce like this totally new technology into your product, like project. Um, let's let's use an ex like let's use a different example just to compare it with. So let's think about how would you introduce something like Redux or React? Let's say you have like a really old project and you want to upgrade it to, to React or Redux. How would you introduce those technologies into your product? Uh, cats. You'd use cats to introduce those. No, wait, I'm, why, why do I have the slide here? Uh, oh, yeah, I want to make an analogy, right? So I want to make an analogy with cats, a uh, catology. So, so my girlfriend and I, so we picked up a cat from an adoption agency like a few months ago, and this is him coming over in the car. And, um, Imagine this is kind of like your existing project, right? So in the beginning, everything was going well. We were kind of familiar with the APIs of the cat, like the cat would alert us via meows if it needed like more resources allocated. Um, we would then feed it. Um, but you'd also have to be careful because if you fed it too much, like it would, it would scale way too much and it would become a bit expensive to maintain, right? Um, but on, on the plus side, it does go to sleep when you're not using it. So it does save on cost on that. So, so, we, so we named him Lambda Cat, right? Um, but then a few weeks later, we got another cat. And he was like a very small cat and a bit, like a bit more full of energy, this one. And it was a bit hard because you couldn't just put them in the same room. They would start fighting, right? Like cats, cats are horrible at diplomacy and really good at using their claws. So we couldn't just do that directly. So what we did in the beginning, we kind of used this bridge, right, where the cats couldn't really have like direct access to each other, um, but at the same time they could kind of get used to each other. So so we left them like that. So after a few weeks, like things things were doing like we're going a lot better. 
right? And now they're, they're just the, the best of friends. And this is what Slack did, right? So why, why am I bringing cats up? Like, th this is what Slack did um, of, like, f over the past few years. So I don't know if you read this. Like, it's been, it's been a bit over Twitter, like this article. But they basically go into how they, they've upgraded their desktop experience, like their desktop client, from their previous logic, which was doing manual DOM updates. Um, it was using global variables to manage state. And they wanted to use like React and Redux, and now they're, they're almost done with the conversion, right? Um, so React and Redux like a really good technology to solve those two problems. Um, but imagine, imagine that, that must have been like a kind of a difficult talk, right, to have with your team and just to propose that, like to, to come up with that multi-year strategy of starting to use React and Redux in your, in your application. Um, but yeah, I'm going to leave the link on there. Like, feel free to check it out. It's, it's really interesting. Um, but they, they finally did it, right? But it was like a multi-year effort. So how would you do that with TypeScript? How would you, how would you bring TypeScript into your project? Well, I'm going to, right, it's no drill. I'm going to do a live demo. And usually I do ask you, like, if you could point out, or if I make any mistakes, if you could point out any problems. Um, but since this is a talk on TypeScript, let's see if TypeScript would help me a bit. So I will cheat a bit. I'm not going to use I'm not going to use a full project. I'm just going to use like I'm going to start out with a single file, okay? And um, I'll just right. So let's see if I can type. Yeah. Okay. Let me know if you can't hear me or if I need to go closer to the microphone. Okay. Right. So. So let's kind of, so we have VS Code, and this is JavaScript. So let's say I want to use, um, I want to find out if my string contains like a certain substring, right? There must be a JavaScript method for that, but oh, what was it? Was it, um, is it contains? No. Oh, let me see. I, I think, I think I actually saw, I think I actually saw a plugin for Visual Studio. So I'll, I'll open up the Visual Studio extensions on here. And if I go to this one, so it's called TypeScript and JavaScript language features. I'll just go ahead and enable that. Let's see what happens. Going back to here, if I add a dot, I suddenly get a lot more suggestions on there. And I can see, oh, the first one's so useful. So it's actually called includes, it's not contains. But I can open it, and I get some I get some information on here. So it's telling me, hey, the first parameter is the search string that you're looking for. You can even have some optional parameters, like the position, if you want. Right? So it has the question mark. That's how it's kind of marked as an optional parameter. And it gives me documentation in line. Right? So and I can, and I can actually right, I, I can just start typing it out, and I can start using it. Like, how useful is that? Um, let's try something else. So. I don't know about you, but if somebody would stop me on the street and offer me like a million pounds to tell them like the arguments of splice in JavaScript, like I, I would have no idea. I would tell them to just keep their money and walk away disappointed, because <laughs> it, it's I, I just can never remember them. But I just enabled that plugin, so let's see. So if I try to use it, oh, again I get all of this useful information. I get like um, the first argument is a start position, and it's a number, so it doesn't just tell me like what the name of it, it also tells me like the type of it. It tells me the like the second argument as well. I can use the down arrow to like cycle through the different overloads of the function. So it's like all the different uh, implementations of that function and how like how I can use it. And again it just gives me documentation in line. And it tells me the return type. So it tells tells me that this returns an array of strings. Like pretty useful information. Um, okay let's Let's go down here. Let's go to a different example. So I have this code here. And it's pretty simple, if else statements. Imagine it's a more complex project, but let's let's use a simple example for now. So like when I wrote this code, like it was very late at night, like it seems correct to me, and I'm expecting like the first console log to happen, right? But I think there's a problem and I'm I'm not even I'm not even gonna try to run it. Like let's like we um Let's just try something first. So I'll go back to my file list. And 
just to see if there are any problems with this code, let's just invoke TypeScript. So this is my file. I'll just go ahead and convert, I'll convert this code to TypeScript. You ready? Boom, done. So it's CS file. Okay, talk done. Um, <laughs> no, so let's, let's go back. Let's go back a bit. And, ah, we already get some problems. We can see that we've not used splice, splice properly, so we've not, we've not sent all the parameters that it needs. But the more important thing, if we go down here, it's saying that oh, this condition will always return false since the types function that returns boolean and true have absolutely no overlap, which is absolutely true, right? It's, it's a super helpful statement. So that, that just tells me that oh, I forgot to just invoke the function. Right? So that kind of fixes the code. So that would be, that would be like the first step when um, so when you first start using TypeScript, when you first convert it, you're going to start out with all these JavaScript files. And as you're converting them, as you're starting to use TypeScript, as you're changing from JavaScript to TypeScript, it's going to start creating some of these problems. Like in some cases, you might, it might actually be true problems, like in this one. Or in some other cases, maybe you haven't provided the type, type information to TypeScript, right? in which case it's going to ask for like more information. Um, Let's also check, so this might be, so let's see. So TypeScript is, is, isn't just, doesn't just verify your code and show you red squiggly lines. It does some other things as well. So it's kind of, it goes through your code and it transpiles it and it generates valid JavaScript for it. So I'll go here into this this folder, just so we can kind of compare the two files. See if I can. Right, so I'll just pull this up. Right, so this is this is the initial types. This is our initial code, and you can kind of see. Right, I, I ran this compiler before, so let me just change it. But um, so you can kind of see they're they're kind of the same, right? So this the TypeScript doesn't do anything. Like why? Can you see like the code on the left looks pretty much similar to the code on the right? Like why why is that? Like why why is what's the point of TypeScript if it just generates the same code? Well, this is already valid JavaScript code to begin with. So TypeScript has nothing else that it can, can add on to it or change with it, right? So TypeScript is just like a very, very thin layer on top of JavaScript, right? So it doesn't, like if, it, if it's valid JavaScript, it's already valid TypeScript as well. So that's why like the, um, the pathway to introducing it in your team will be, should be a bit easier than some of the other languages. Like for example, let's say you were going to Elm or ReasonML or languages like that that are just a completely different syntax. Like TypeScript is just valid JavaScript as well. Um, what about using other libraries? Let's see. So let's try and import. Let me just close this. Let me try and import. Um, let me try and import Lodash. So I already had this npm installed. I should have had. Uh, from Lodash. Thank you. So perfect. So. If I now try and use, again, for this library, I get all of those very useful suggestions. I don't have to go ahead to, to their docs to look up different methods, different APIs, how do you use them. I don't have to do all of that. I get all of that information in line um, as I'm typing. And again, I get, I get suggestions, like what's the first parameter, the last parameter. It needs a function. It even gives me documentation in line. And how does TypeScript know about this? Right, because you'd expect it to know about splice because it's it's an ES it's, it's an ES function. But what about Lodash? Like, how does it know about that? Well, when you install libraries, so as TypeScript is becoming more and more popular, when you install libraries, most are already starting to ship with their own types. However, sir, um, for example, Lodash doesn't ship with types, but it's just for most libraries, it's a case of just adding at add types in front of your npm install. I don't know if you can see that. All right, but um, so at types is just another GitHub library that just has all of like it's it's a collection of just TypeScript types for different libraries. So that's what it does. So if you most of the time if you install a library, you can just install the types with that. Cool. Okay. So oh, this is a type talk on TypeScript, and we still not seen any types. So let's let's go into this other file, and let's actually create a type. So 
I'll create an interface. And I'll say I want an interface for a person. So how, what would be the properties of a person? So a person would have a name, which would be a string, um, age, number, just, yeah. Ultimate proof that age is just a number. So, right, so this is, um, so what, what's an interface, right? When I say interface, it's also a type. And what's a type? It's, it just describes the shape of an actual value in our code. So like w when you have like different object instances or, or string values or numbers, um, those are all different types. And this type describes how, how an actual person object will look like. So it's gonna have a name which is a string and an age which is a number. So now if, now if we assign it to this one, right, I, I create a new object and TypeScript is already gonna start to suggest me different properties I can add on to that. So I can, I can add an age, um, say 32. Um, again, it's gonna suggest me all the remaining properties. So it's gonna see that I've added age and it's gonna suggest me name now that I just have name to add. So let's call him Ali. Okay, so it's complaining about page already. So it's saying type, str type string is not assignable to type number. Cool, that's exactly what I was expecting, right? Because it, it won't accept like me to assign any object to this. That's not the same shape that I was expecting. Same on here, it's a function. So uh, you can also assign types to function parameters. In this case, I'm saying that, I'm just adding that this is a function that prints the name of a person and it's expecting a person, so if I'm not using it correctly inside of it, it's of course gonna point, gonna point me the error. So in this case, it's a uh, misspell. Like how many times have, like have you had problems just because of like mis misspelling like a certain variable name? So TypeScript is, just, this is like the simplest best feature of TypeScript. Um, it also tests if you're using it correctly. So when I'm invoking the function, am I invoking it with the correct type? Does this type have like any, any weird property on it? If it does, then it's, it's not gonna accept it, right? Because it's like something that has a weird property in it is not a person. So TypeScript is gonna complain about it. Right, and you, you might have started noticing already like how, actually let's, let's do something. So let's see, let's see if this works. I'll try to start the watch task. Right, so what this does, I hope, it's, it's gonna start compiling this file in the background. So now, again, if I open up this on the side, just so we can look at them side by side, so it's gonna work. Right, so again, it just squishes up the code, but you can already see on the right there that the code looks very similar, but we don't have, we don't have this interface, we don't have the types, um, even the f at the function, we don't have the types. So like those are just TypeScript constructs. JavaScript doesn't know about them. The browser doesn't know about them. So when TypeScript goes through your code, it's gonna strip away all of this type information if it looks okay to TypeScript. Otherwise, um, you can tell it to not emit the code at all. So you can tell it, hey, don't, don't actually build me JavaScript files that are wrong if there's anything wrong with them. Um, Okay, and finally, so you can see like how, how I started adding like a few properties on here. Um, so th that would seem a bit alarming, right? Like what if we start using TypeScript and we're gonna have all of these different types littered throughout our code now, and maybe they're gonna complicate it, they're gonna make it like a bit harder to maintain. Well, TypeScript tries to be as smart as possible with you. So it tries to infer your types. So what do I mean by that? So you can see on here I have, um, let me close this. You can see on here I have an array and like of people and the first one is, is an actual person. The second one is an object that looks like a person but I haven't actually specified anywhere that it's a person, right? Like for, for the first object, I've said this variable is of type person. But for the second one, it just looks like a person, right? But I haven't told TypeScript anywhere about this. Let's build up, let's build up an array of just an, the names of people. So I'll go people.map, right? And map accepts a callback. And what two parameters do we have to send to the callback? So it's index and then we get called for each person in that list. So, sorry, person. 
So now, let me just try and return that. I get an error. Property name does not exist on type number, so it's expecting person to be a number. All oh, right, because this should be in reverse, yeah. That was not staged at all. So, <laughs> um, so right, so, so like it even tells you, so it knows like what types of parameters like maps, map accepts, like a person and the second one is an index, and it knows that the, um, and if I hover over it, you can see there that it points out, so each person, like whenever that function will be called, will be of type I person. So it's gonna let me call name on it. Like if I try to call anything else on it, again, it's gonna complain. So how does it know that? So like TypeScript actually looks at everything and it sees, oh yeah, this, this kinda looks like a person. This is a person, so this, might, this must mean that this is an array of I person. So you can see it there when you hover over it. And then it know also know how maps work, how map works. So it knows that when you call it on an array, it's gonna call your callback with each person in that list. So based on that, you can extract the information that like in that function, each person will be a person. So I didn't have to actually specify, I could have, TypeScript wouldn't, like, sorry. It doesn't, yeah, because it's not an array, it's a person, right, so that works, right? So I could have I done that. Um, TypeScript would be fine with that, but you don't have to. TypeScript tries to help you as much as possible. Um, cool, let's go back to the slides a bit. So, yeah, so you can see, like, a lot of people think TypeScript is just types and interfaces and red squiggly lines all, all over your code. Um, all, and also, they, like, um, you can imagine, like, TypeScript being a tool that you either have or don't have in your app. And that might, that might seem, like, daunting to people, like, wanting to actually use TypeScript in their application. Like, okay, how do I go from not having TypeScript to having TypeScript? That seems daunting, complicated. But it's so much more than that, and it has like so many layers. So you can start with a vanilla JavaScript file, and you can convert it to a TypeScript file. You can rename it if you want. If you don't want to, you can, you can continue to just rely on the tooling that VS Code offers it. Um, what if that JavaScript file probably imports, ad so when you convert it to TypeScript, it probably imports other JavaScript files in your code, right? You're in the middle of your transition. Do you suddenly have to convert all of the code that it imports as well, and all of that code? Well, no, because TypeScript offers you a configuration option with allow.js, so that allows you to just keep importing JavaScript files until you finish the conversion, right, in your TypeScript. Um, what else? You can, you can add, like, different levels of strictness. So once, it, you once, once you're in the TypeScript wagon and you're starting to write app types and interfaces and so on, you can start making it more and more strict, um, which is gonna make your code safer but it, you're also gonna get slapped on the wrist a bit more, right? So TypeScript is gonna start complaining. It's gonna make you work harder to make your code safer. So for example, with no implicit any, when TypeScript can detect what type something is, it's actually gonna, um, um, it's gonna assign it the any type. And the any type is like the more, ge like the more generic type. You can, you can call it, you can call any property on it. Like TypeScript doesn't care, so it's very, very unsafe. So, but if you add this uh, option on there, it's not gonna let you have any implicit any type in your code. Um, strict null checks, this is very useful. So um, this won't let you write any code where it does, it's not sure if something will be undefined or not. Right, so if you have like a variable that's undefined and uh, that might be undefined, TypeScript will go, oh, you have to prove to me that it's not undefined before I'm gonna let you use it. And this helps like avoid so many errors, like, like kind of like this, right? Like, how many times have you seen that? Um, but, but again, like it's super complicated because you're gonna have to work so much extra harder like just to prove to TypeScript every time that, hey, I promise this is not gonna be undefined. I promise this is not undefined. Look, I'm checking. Um, so yeah, like it can become annoying. So it's up to you and your team. Like, and th this is, that option, that's like boss level. So that's, that, that, like, that like enables all the six TypeScript strict options. So that's gonna make your like your compiler the strictest possible. So that's only for like the most daring of teams if you wanna use it. Um, I've, I've, not, I've not worked on any project where that's being used. Um, so, so yeah, you can kinda see like how TypeScript just lets you start from zero and you can, it's like a dial. So you can kinda dial up the strictness of the compiler. So it's up to you. Um, this is a really good talk, so it's from Airbnb. So it's kinda how they were, how they actually adopted uh, TypeScript. So it's their strategy from 
proposing it to the business to actually implementing it. Um, spoiler, 38% of their production errors could have been preventable. So they went back and analyzed all of their production errors for the past year, and they found out 38% could have been prevented by the use of TypeScript. So yeah, I really recommend you have a look at that after this. Uh, it goes on to a lot more strategies. Um, just a quick, so, quick demo again. Um, so I'm in this. Right, I just want to show you a bit of, like, a few more features that make TypeScript interesting and it make it closer, like, closer to your heart as a JavaScript developer. So TypeScript, like JavaScript, has a lot of features where it, it, it makes you go, like, but why? Like, why would I use that? Um, and you can kind of see this here. So I create a new type. So again, types are like interfaces. I create a new type that's a pet that can either be a dog or a fish. Okay, that makes sense. Like, makes sense in English. Like, a, okay, like, yeah, okay, a pet can be a dog or a fish. That's, that kind of makes sense in English. But what does it mean in TypeScript? Like, what, what's a type that's either like a dog or a fish? And you can see like, um, these are the properties from them. And if I try in this function to call something on pet, the only thing it's gonna let me call, and I don't know if you can see that, is the ID property. Why is that? So the ID property is the only one that's common between those two types, right? So if it can't let me call um, swim on it, because what if it's a dog, right? Like a, a pet, like a pet is also a dog. Like this function could be called with a dog, okay? So, but then why, why would we actually use this? Well, in JavaScript, if I were to write something like this, right, so this is just JavaScript syntax, but I can say, right, so I can write something like that. So that's, that's just the JavaScript in operator, so it kind of checks if the swim, sweet, swim speed property is on, on my pet like argument. Um, and we kind of know that if it is, then it's probably a fish, right? Because like, like dogs can't swim, like underwater. So, <laughs> so we, we kind of know that, but does TypeScript know that, right? We, we've just, we've not told TypeScript anything. We just told it that this can be a dog or a fish. We didn't help TypeScript that much. And if we try to call properties on it, we can see that, yeah, so like it gives us now more things to call on it. It gives us swim, you can call swim on it and it's not gonna complain. Right, because it can be, sh it can also be sure that it's a, like it's it's a fish in, in the context, just in the context of this if statement. If I try below it to call some properties on it, again, it's it's only gonna let me call ID, because once once I go past the if statement, again, it can be a dog or a fish, in that case. But what if I return from here? What if inside the if statement I return? In that case. I get dog properties below it, right? So, um, because TypeScript knows that, okay, if it's a fish, it's gonna go inside the if statement, it's gonna swim a bit, and then it's gonna return, right? So it's gonna return the function. So by the time it gets to this line, we know that it's like, the only thing it can be is it's, 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 it's a dog, right? Um, so we can, kind of, we can kind of safely call that. So that's cool, because TypeScript is, again, trying to be as helpful as possible, and it's kind of trying to intelligently look at your JavaScript code and try to infer from that what types objects can be. So it tries to use as much of the information as possible that, that it's available to TypeScript. It's trying to use that just to generate different things. Um, and again, like another example, like how close it is to JavaScript, you know how, in, you've probably seen this, like when you call a, when you want to get the value of an object's property, you just call like object and then straight brackets and then you can put the string value inside the straight brackets and that gives you the, the value of that object to that property. Well, you can do the same with TypeScript. So you can go, I want the type of ID to be, look at the dog interface and then look at the type of ID from the dog interface and whatever type ID is on dog, that's gonna be the type of the ID on the fish as well. So now, so now if I ever change this, it's also gonna change on the fish as well. So this is, this, is how, like, this is how TypeScript is trying to be like as close to like the heart of JavaScript developers as possible. And it's trying to be as close to, to JavaScript and just, and just make it 
Um, it was just built with JavaScript in mind, just to, just to function on top of it. Um, cool. Okay, let's. I think we're ready for the next part, which is Redux. So th this is this is where all of these like are kind of starting to fall into place. So I have some actions. Um, so I, I created them like this. So they're just a bunch of classes. They're the read-only type. Um, you can initialize them with a constructor and a payload, and each one of them have a payload, right? So um, in Redux, like like an action can have a type, which is a string, and optionally it can have a payload. Um, so yeah, for example, if I want to add a to-do, the payload will be a string. Like what what to-do do you actually want me to add? Remove all, for example. This is not gonna have this is not gonna have a payload because it doesn't need a payload. If I call the remove all action, it's gonna know what to do. Like remove all to-dos. Um, if I want to remove one, I need to send the index of it, right? So the point of this is each action has always have so all the remove all actions always have the same type string all the remove one all the add actions always have the same add string and each of them can have different payloads right so let's go back now to, let's go to the actual reducer and yeah you so this is a reducer right so it accepts it accepts an action and the state and it's going to generate a new state based on that action that it got and and then we can kind of switch over them so we switch over the action type and this is the magic part so we we switch over strings right which makes sense we want to switch over the string value so we want to look at is this look at look at the type of the action is it an add action if it is return this piece of state but what if what if I'm not sure how to use this? Like what if um, like let let's say let's say on the action that payload let, let's say um, it has this so let let's right, let's just do something. Let's say for example I, I wanna assign the payload to a number. I like let's say let's say to do number Let, let's say I'm not sure I kind of forgot like how the action interface works I kind of want to say ah uh, I think I'm getting the to do number on this one as part of the payload well TypeScript is actually not going to let me because it knows that the payload of the add action so you can actually see it here it's going to be a string so this is this is really cool I think because it's I mean, it seems obvious to us, right? Because we, we think that, yeah, okay, I'm handling the add action. I kind of know that it's going to be like a, a string in there. But to make that safe in there and to make sure that any developer in the future that ever works inside this block of code will correct, will, can, can only use the payload of that action in a way that it was meant to be used, like that, that's, that's really safe and we, we didn't have to add anything extra. So. Going back to what I said earlier, so this is the, let me show the actions again. Um, so, because I, I haven't shown you the thing at the bottom where it kind of builds up, same as, as we had the pet before where it was a dog and a fish, we kind of build up that list of actions with all of the actions, and then we say in the reducer, these are the types of actions that it can accept. So then TypeScript can just know that Ah, if I'm if I'm handling if the type of the action will be add because the add action is of type add, that's a quirk of TypeScript, by the way. So it's able to differentiate like not just strings, but also like specific strings. So that's an actual type add, like the string add. Right? So I can actually go in here, I can infer the type of the action on here. Um, even in here, so if I try to, for example, call like I don't know, call contains on this. Again, it's gonna complain because it says contains doesn't exist on type array of string. Let me uh, right. Oh, sorry, because the state is to do's. Oh, sorry, I want to do it in here. So like payload. All right. So if I do like for example, um, no includes. What was that method name? Includes. All right. So if I try to call includes on this. 
property includes does not, does not exist on type number. So again, I'm, I'm using it in the wrong way and TypeScript is kind enough to let me know. Um, and it's also, it's, it's also gonna suggest you like different, different actions you can call in here. So you can call add, remove all, um, Okay, so maybe suggesting all of them, but I can see, oh yeah, now it says, so case, now it's gonna suggest all the types of like strings that I can add in there based on the actions that this reducer is gonna accept. Um, and finally, so I'm, I'm only, so this accepts like three different types of actions, but I'm only sending it two types of actions. Is there any way we can use the power of TypeScript to make it complain if we're not handling all of those actions in our reducer? And this is, this is kind of like a weird way. So TypeScript, like it's, it's not, it doesn't look very TypeScript-y, but it does work. So look at this. So I can send, um, can do a case, sorry, not case default, default. Right, so I can handle the default case. In the default case, so if it doesn't fall into any of those, I can create a new, a new variable. Let's call it action. No, uh, let's call it x, because I already have action. I'm gonna assign it whatever action I get from the reducer. And for the type of x, it's gonna be of type never, which is a valid JavaScript, which is a valid TypeScript type. So what never, so now it's complaining because it's saying type remove all is not assignable to type never. So what that's telling me is that I have a, a non-handled action called remove all, which is gonna be handled by the default case um, because I'm not handling it here as part of the case. And because the never type can never happen, TypeScript doesn't let us keep that in there. So now the only way to get rid of that is if I, as if I handle it in here, right? So that's gonna make me return an array of blank to do's. So that kind of fixes it. Right? So TypeScript kind of helps you with that as well. Right? So it can make your reducers really safe. And the final thing I, I wanted to show you is, yeah, so when you, when you build up your Redux state, so it can become really complex. So you can have, um, you can have your root Redux state can kind of look like that. You can also, it can also have like arrays of to-dos under it, which looks like this. And each to-do maybe has like a linked email for some reason, which looks like this. So it can kind of go very, very deep and you can might start to lose track of it. And you know how states like in Redux need to be immutable, right? So in Redux, a state is immutable, so you can't, you, you can't really change properties on it. The only way you can change it is you can kind of dispatch actions and then let the reducer generate a new state for you. So how do we make sure of that in the code? How do we make sure developers know how to use that in the code? How do we make sure people don't just start mutating the state directly? Well, we could start, like there's the read-only keyword in TypeScript, right? So we can start adding read-only keywords everywhere in our state. But that's not really right, because that means we're gonna have to add it everywhere, we're gonna have to make sure developers that add new properties to our state or create new pieces of state in the future, they're gonna need to start adding read-onlys as well, right? Which it's kinda hard to maintain. Ideally, we would have our state represented like this, but then we'd have some magic TypeScript, like magic logic, that's gonna go through our state and it's gonna convert everything, every property in it, to read only. And this is what I have here. So I have this type read only root state that's generated by, so, so that's why I kinda had your hand raised up like if you were to Java or other type languages before. I'm using generics here and I'm passing in, so this is, a, this is an interface, that I, this is a type that accepts generics and I'm passing in my root state to it. So generics are kind of like, can you imagine them like functions, but for types. So you can, you can pass in things to other types and get new types from them. So this is this deep read-only type. I can pass it in my root state and it's gonna generate me a read-only state. So now if I try to call anything on my read-only state, like it's not, um, I, I can kind of try it here. So I can go states dot, to do's, I can say it's a new array. 
and it says, can I assign to to do this because it's a read-only property, even though we haven't made it read-only specifically. So, yeah, like I'm not going to go into how, what's that? Okay, I'm going to go into how this works, okay. Um, okay, maybe I'm not going to go exactly into how it works, but this, like it, it, can, it, can, it can get kind of complex, right? But, but the point is, this can be exported as a library and then you can import it, right? So you don't need to, don't need to look into this. Like it, but the thing is, this is possible with TypeScript. Um, yeah, you can kind of see in here like conditional logic where you have like ternary operators in TypeScript. You thought you would get away from them, but no, you have them in TypeScript as well. And, uh, and they actually have real use cases. Like they're actually, they can actually be useful. Cool, so that's, yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to show on the on the Redux side. Um, yeah, so just to finish off, again, that's my Twitter handle. Um, just feel free to message me on Twitter if you have absolutely any questions about any parts of the code. Um, I'm happy to share it. It's on GitHub as well. Along, so on GitHub, I've shared like the start of the code, the ending as well, just so you can see where I've kind of ended up. Um, I've shared my slides on there as well. And also, if you do have an Xhead subscription, I, c I go over all of these and a few more other interesting features in this course. And it's kind of like in video format. So I kind of go, I, I, I explain, for example, like how the deep read only type works um, in that. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Hi. I just wanted to ask what's uh, your take on the accessors? Uh, like, you know, having variables or functions like pub public, private. And also, just kind of, I don't know if you would know, but like sometimes if you, let's say, you would try to implement something like a uh, linked list in TypeScript and then you want to give it the generic type, uh, you would give it the generic type and then I guess you would like pipe it to null, right? And then for some reason, like it complains and I don't really know why, maybe you would know. Um, yeah. I'm not connected to the internet. Like that, that would have been cool like for a second question for me just to pull up my course and show you because I have an exact lesson about um, like infinite types and linked lists where I kind of build. Like I'm, I'm not sure if it's gonna answer your question, but I can share the code for that. So again, I have like a GitHub where it kind of sh it kind of shares exactly because you um, so you you can create generics that kind of reference themselves. So if you for ex um, you can still be no. still yes. Um, could have been the case that you had like you you know when I talked about the uh, null no implicit no like what was the one I mentioned. Uh, strict null checks. Could it be that you maybe had that enabled? Right, because what, what strict null checks does is it kind of, it separates the null and undefined. So usually when you first build up with TypeScript, it has the null and undefined types. They're part of every type, other type as well. So like string can automatically be null and undefined. But when you enable that option, um, it kind of separates that out and it forces you to explicitly say this can be null as well. Otherwise, if you don't specify it can be null, it's going to complain if, it, if there's the slightest possibility it's going to be null. Um, and just the, the first part about accessors, um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of use TypeScript in the context of Angular a lot, and that's really helpful for just kind of building encapsulated services. So you can build, you can expose just the APIs of the services that you want, and then anything internally that other consumers of that service shouldn't care about, um, they shouldn't be able to access that. So um, I've not, I, yeah, I've, I try not to use inheritance that much, so like things like protected and stuff, but you, you can, you do have protected, the protected keyword in TypeScript as well. Um, but apart from that, you have, yeah, public, private, protected. Was that kind of what you asked, or? Uh, so, well, I was wondering if like, you could actually even expect it if it's all well down to the S, and then like these codes uh, okay. disappear. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, very good point. Um, yeah, it kind of does give you a false sense of security when you try and use like public and private in TypeScript. When you convert it to JavaScript, it's not respected. Yeah, so you can still call it on this. So things like the state that I showed you, um, that's only going to protect you at compile time. It's not actually going to stop you at runtime for from mutating the state. So you'd still, 
you'd still need like another pattern, maybe like the revealing module pattern or something like that, just to make sure you have like true private and public, uh, like public and private. Uh, so yeah, just about the uh, that thing with the never type uh, in in the cases so that that was really nice because I wasn't aware of that. It's uh, it's really cool, but um, it's obviously like maybe like a little bit clunky. Um, I was just wondering, do you know if um, is the compiler kind of smart enough to get rid of that code? Uh, like, would it would it just remove it uh, from the compiled JS, or would it just leave this kind of redundant? you know assignment and i mean it's not that big of a deal but it just yeah. just for interest yeah good observation yeah so um yeah it's it's totally gonna leave that in there right because it's a it is it is it is valid javascript like right, to have a variable and like in, in a default case um it's it's never gonna reach it so because it makes sure you're handling all the action types it's never actually gonna get to that so it's never actually gonna affect your code in any way it's not gonna cause you any problems it's just gonna have you yeah it is gonna leave it in there so it is it is a bit clunky, yeah. Um, I don't know if there's a way to, maybe in future versions. <laughs> like kind of yeah, that, well, that was going to be my follow-up. Do you know if, if they're planning to add anything like that? Yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't looked at it. Um, yeah, because it, it is, you would think it's like a really popular use case to be able to know if you're handling all of the actions like in your user. Yeah. Um, but no, I haven't. Uh, like that's that's kind of like a w like it pro they probably expect you to like just know how to handle them or or maybe it's valid to maybe you might not always want to handle everything in your review set like maybe you send it like more actions than you need right so maybe yeah. any more questions well thank you very much oh <laughs> it's a quick question. I just wonder if you need to use a VS Code to use TypeScript because you get all the uh, um, suggestions in VS Code. Is it specifically for VS Code? Um, no, you don't. No, you don't need to use it. Like it can, like the, there, are, TypeScript is available everywhere. Like it's 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 actually like a, a command line thing, so you can. I think, well, part of the reason why I think it became so popular is because it started shipping with VS Code. So like, it's that, that has like the most beautiful integration. Um, but TypeScript itself, like just the compiler, it's like Node. Right? So you can just kind of use the TypeScript compiler everywhere. And you don't really need to. So for example, like there's a TypeScript plugin for Babel where it just, um, it kind of notifies you if there are any problems, even though it doesn't compile them. Doesn't com it doesn't actually run your code through the TypeScript compiler. It does notify you if there are any TypeScript problems with them. Um, there's like a Webpack loader as well for TypeScript. Like there are, there are loads of tools for TypeScript everywhere. Um, so yeah, you, you, don't need to, you don't need VS Code. But for the IntelliSense, yeah, you might want an ID that has IntelliSense support. Yeah.